live from Munich, Germany, it's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit Europe 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Okay, welcome back everyone here. Day two coverage of theCUBE here in Germany, Munich, Germany for DataWorks 2017. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, SiliconANGLE Media's theCUBE. Our next guest is Raj Verma, President and COO of Hortonworks. Uh, first time on theCUBE, new to Hortonworks. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, Sean. Appreciate Great keynote, it. Yeah. Uh, looking, looking good with a three-piece <laughs> suit. We were commenting uh, when you were on stage. Uh, great, Thank you. great scene here uh, in Europe. Again, different show vis-a-vis -vis North America uh, in San Jose. You got the show coming up there. It's the big show. Right. Here, it's a little bit different. A lot of IoT in Germany. Sure. You got a lot of car manufacturers, but industrial nation here, smart cities initiatives. Um, a lot of big data. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, um, firstly, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure and uh, good chit-chatting right before the show <laughs> as well. Uh, we are very, very excited about well, the entire data space. Uh, Europe is leading many uh, initiatives about um, you know, how to use data as a sustainable competitive differentiator. I just moderated a panel and you guys heard me talk to a retail bank, a retailer, and really Centrica, which was nothing but British gas, uh, which is a, a rather, you know, an organization steeped in history, so as to speak. And that institution is now, calls itself a technology company. And it's a technology company or an IoT company based on them using data as the currency for innovation. So now British Gas or Centrica calls itself a data company. When would you have ever thought that? I was um, at dinner with a very large automotive manufacturer and the kind of stuff they are doing with data, right from driving habits, driver safety, um, real-time insurance, premium calculation, um, the autonomous drive, uh, it's, just, it's just fascinating. No matter what industry you talk about, um, it's just uh, very, very interesting and uh, we are very glad to be here and um, you know, international business is a big priority we, for me. We've been following Hortonworks since its inception when it uh, spun out of Yahoo uh, years ago. I think we've been to every Hadoop world going back to except for the, except for the first one. We've watched uh, the transition and it's interesting, you've, it's always been a learning environment at these shows and certainly the customer testimony speaks to the, the ecosystem. But I have to ask you, you're new to Hortonworks. Um, you have an interesting technology background. Um, why did you join Hortonworks? Because um, you've certainly seen the movies before and the cycles of innovation, yes. uh, but now we're living in, in, in a pretty epic machine learning, data, AI is on the horizon. What were the reasons why you joined Hortonworks? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I've had a really good run in technology. Fortunately, it was associated with two great companies, Parametric Technology and Tipco Software. I was um, 16 years at Tipco, so I've been dealing with data for 16 years. But over the course of the last couple of years, whenever I spoke to a C-level executive or a CIO, they were talking to us about uh, the fact that structured data, which is really what uh, we did for 16 years, was not good enough for innovation. Innovation and insights into unstructured data was a seminal challenge of most of the executives that I was talking to, senior level executives. And um, when you're talking about unstructured data and making sense of it, there isn't a better technology <laughs> than the one that we are dealing with right now, um, undoubtedly. Uh, so that was one, you know, dealing with data, because data is really the currency of our times. All right? every, every company is a data company. Second was, you know, I've been involved with proprietary software for 23 years. And if there is a business model that's ready for disruption, it's the proprietary software business model because I'm absolutely convinced that open source is what I call a green business model. It's good for planet Earth, so as to speak. It's a community based, it's uh, based on innovation, and it puts the customer and the technology provider um, on the same page. You know, the customer's success drives the vendor's success. And uh, yeah, so the open source community, data, and... Um, it's sustainable, the, uh, pun intended, in the sense that it's had a continuing run, and it's interesting, tier one software is all open source now. 
hundred percent. And and by the way, not only that, if you see large companies like IBM and Microsoft, they are they have finally woken up to the fact that they if they need to attract talent and if they want to be known as thought leaders, they have to have some very meaningful open source initiatives. Microsoft loves Linux. When did we ever think that was going to happen, right? And, and by the way, I think Steve Ballmer once said it was the cancer uh, of the industry. <laughs> right. Now they're, they're behind it. But this is the Linux Foundation is also growing. We saw um, a project just last, this past week, Intel uh, donated a big project to the Linux Foundation taking over, so more projects. Yes. There's more, more action happening than ever before. You know, absolutely, John. You know, five years ago when I would go and meet a um, CIO and um, I would ask them about open source and they would wink, they say, of course, we do open source, but it's less than 5%, right? Uh, now, when I talk to a CIO, they first ask their teams to go evaluate open source as, a, as, as the first choice, and if they can't, they come kicking and streaming towards proprietary software. Most organizations, and some organizations with, you know, with uh, a lot of historical gravity, so as to speak, uh, have a 50-50 even split between proprietary and open source. And that's happened in the last three years. And I can, I can you know, make a bold statement, and I know it will be true, that in the next three years, most organizations the ratio of proprietary to open source would be 20 proprietary, 80 open source. So obviously you've made that bet on open source, joining Hortonworks, <laughs> but open is a spectrum. Right? And, and on one end of the spectrum you have Hortonworks, which yes. is, as I see it, the, the purest. You know? Now, even Larry Ellison, when he gets on stage at Oracle Open World, will talk about how open <laughs> Oracle is. I guess that's the other end of the spectrum. So my question is, won't the Microsofts and the Oracles and the IBM, they're like recovering alcoholics and they'll, they'll accommodate their platforms through open source, embracing open source. We'll see if AWS does the same. <laughs> we know it's a unidirectional there. How do you see that well, not necessarily. industry kind of, dynamic? You know, well, we'll talk about that later. How do you see <laughs> that industry dynamic shaking out? No, absolutely. I think, you know, I remember way back in, um, I think, the mid to late 90s, I still love that quote by Scott McNeely, who's a friend. Um, Dell, uh, not Dell, Digital, came out with a, um, with a marketing campaign saying, open VMS. Yeah. And Scott said, how can someone lie so much with one word? <laughs> <You> know, <open. laughs> so it's just the fact that, you know, Oracle calling itself open, well, I'll, I'll just, you know, leave it at that. It's a good joke. Um, I think the, the definition of open source to me is when, when you acquire a software, you have three real costs. One is the cost of initial procuring that software and the hardware and all the rest of it. The second is implementation and maintenance. However, most people miss the third dimension of cost when acquiring software, which is the cost to exit the technology. Our software and open source has very low exit barriers to our technology. If you don't like our technology, switch it off, you own the software anyway, switch off our services, and the barrier of exits are very, very low. Having worked in proprietary software, as I said, for 23 years, I've very often had conversations with my customers where you know, I would say, look, you really don't have a choice, because if you want to exit my technology, it's going to probably cost you 10 times more than what you've spent till date. So it's a lock-in architecture, and then you milk that customer through maintenance, right? So switching costs really are the switching the, costs the metric are, are you, exactly. You gave the example of Blockbuster off camera, right? And and the rental, uh, the, the 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 late charge fees. Okay, that's a that's an example of of, of lock-in. So as we as we look at your the the company you're most compared with now that is going public, Cloudera. In a way, I see more similarities than differences. I mean, you guys are both sort of birds of a feather. Um, but you are going for what I call the long game um, with a you know, volume subscription model, and Cloudera has chosen to build proprietary components on top. So you have to make big bets on open, you have to support those open technologies. How do you see that you know, affecting you know, the long-term business model? Yeah, I think uh, we've, 
we are committed to open source. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I do feel that um, you know we are connected data platform, which is data at rest and data in motion across on-prem and cloud, is um, is the business model that's going to win. We clearly have momentum um, on our side. Uh, you've seen the same filings that I have seen. You know, there's, you're talking about a company that had a three-year head start on us had a billion dollars of funding, all right, um, at, at very high valuations, and yet they're only one year ahead in terms of revenue, and they have burnt probably three times more cash than we have. So clearly, and I, it's not my opinion, if you look at the numbers purely, uh, the numbers actually give us the credibility that our business model and what we are doing is more efficient and is working better. One of the um, arguments that I offer here, often hear from analysts and press is, how are your margins on open source? According to the filings again, no. their margins are 82% on proprietary software, my margins on open source are 84%. So from a health of the business perspective, we are better. Now, the other is, you know, they claim to have been making a pivot to a more machine learning and deep learning and all the rest of it, and they, they, they actually like us to believe that uh, their competition is going to be Amazon, IBM, and Google. Now, with a billion dollars of funding with the Intel ecosystem behind them, they couldn't effectively compete against Hortonworks. What do you think are their chances of competing against Google, Amazon, and IBM? I just leave that for you guys to decide, to be honest with you, and, and we feel very good that um, that they have virtually vacated the space and uh, you know, we, we've got the momentum, so on I'm very the, excited. On the numbers, what jumps out at you on the filing subs? Obviously, I'm sure everyone at Hortonworks was digging through the S1 because for the first time now, <laughs> Cloudera right. exposes some of the numbers. Um, I noticed some striking things different, obviously besides their you know, multiple on revenue and valuation, it's pretty obvious there's going to be a haircut uh, coming after the public offering. But on the sales side, which is your wheelhouse, there's a value proposition that, that you guys in Hortonworks have been, we've, we've been watching, the cadence of uh, getting new clients, servicing clients, with product evolution is challenging, and also, but, but also expensive, it's not, you guys, but it getting better, as, as Sean Connolly pointed out yesterday, you guys are looking at some profitability targets on the EBITDA uh, coming up in Q4, publicly stated on the earnings call. How's that different than Cloudera? Are they, burning more cash because of their sales motions or sales costs, or is it um, the product mix? What's your thoughts from the filings around uh, Cloudera versus the Hortonworks? Well, I, look, I, I just feel that, you know, I can talk more about my business than, than theirs. Uh, clearly, you've seen the same filings that I have, and you've seen the same cash burn rates that we have seen. Uh, we clearly are more efficient, uh, though we can still get better, but because of being public for a little more than two years now, we've had a thousand watt bulb being shown at us, and we have been forced to be more efficient because we were in the limelight. In right? the open. <laughs> in the open, right? So people knew what our figures are, what our efficiency ratios were, so we've been working diligently at improving them, and we've gotten better, and there's still scope for improvement. However, um, being private, did not have the same scrutiny on Cloudera. And uh, some would say that they were actually spending money like drunken sailors if you really read their S1 filing. So they will come under a lot of scrutiny as well. I'm sure they'll get more efficient. But right now, clearly, you've seen the same numbers that yeah. I have, their, um, their numbers don't talk about efficiency um, either in the R&D side or the sales and marketing side. Um, so yeah, we, we feel very good yeah. about where where we are in that well, place. Well, I mean, an open source is this two-edged sword. Like, you know, take Yarn for example. I mean, from at least from my perspective, Hortonworks and uh, you really led the charge to, to Yarn, and then well before Docker and Kubernetes ascendancy, and then all of a sudden that happens, and of course you've got to embrace embrace those open source trends. So you have the unique challenge of having to support sort of all the open source platforms, and, and so that's why I call it the long game. You, yes. you, you, in order for you guys to, to thrive, you've got to both put resources into those multiple projects, and you've got to get the volume of your subscription model, which you've pointed out, the marginal economics are just as good as most, if not any, software business. Absolutely. So how do you manage that um, resource allocation? 
Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of that is the fact that we've got um, plenty of contributors and committers to the open source community. We are also seen as the angel child in open source sure. because we are just pure, kosher open source. We just don't have a single line of proprietary code. So we are, um, you know, we are committed to that community and uh, we have, over the last six or seven years, developed models of, of software development which helps us manage the collective bargaining power, so as to speak, of the community to allocate resources and prioritize the allocation of resources. It continues to be a challenge given the breadth of the open source community and what we have to handle. But uh, fortunately, I'm blessed that we've got a very, very capable engineering organization <laughs> that uh, keeps us very efficient and uh, on the cutting edge. We're here with Raj Verma, the new president and uh, COO of Hortonworks, uh, Chief Operating Officer. Um, I've got to ask you, because it's interesting, you're coming in with a fresh set of eyes uh, coming in, as you mentioned, from uh, TIBCO. Interesting, which is very successful in the generation of its time and the history of TIBCO, where uh, it came from and what it did was pretty fantastic. I mean, everyone knows, you know, Remarkable. connecting data together was very hard in the in the enterprise world. Tipco has some challenges today, as you're seeing, uh, as with being disrupted by open source. But I got to ask you, as a prospective new executive, you got looking at the battlefield and opportunity with open source. There's some significant things happening, and what are you excited about? Because Hortonworks has actually done some interesting things. Some, I would say, um, the world spun in their direction. Their relationship with Microsoft, for instance, mm -hmm. and their, their growth in cloud has been fantastic. I mean, Microsoft's stock price, when they first started working with Hortonworks, I think it was like 26, and I'll see Satya Nutella on, uh, on board, Azure, they're more open source on open compute to Kubernetes and microservices, Azure doing very, very well. You also have a partnership with Amazon Web Services, so you already are living in this cloud era, okay? Um, and so you have a cloud <laughs> dynamic going on, are you, are you excited by that? And, and you, you bring some partnership expertise in, from in, uh, Tibco. How do you look at partners? Because you guys don't really compete with anybody, but you're partnering with everybody. So you're kind of yeah. like Switzerland, but you're also uh, doing a lot of partnerships. What are you excited about vis-a-vis -vis the cloud and some of the other partnerships that are happening? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, having a robust partner ecosystem is probably my number one priority. Uh, maybe number two after being profitable yeah. in, in a short span of time which is again publicly stated. Now our partnership with Microsoft is very, very special to us. Um, being available on Azure, uh, we are seeing some fantastic growth rates coming in uh, from Azure. We are also seeing remarkable um, amount of traction from the market uh, to be able to go and test out our platform with very, very low barriers of entry and of course almost zero barriers of exit. So from a partnership platform, cloud providers like Amazon, Microsoft are very, very important to us. We are also getting a lot of interest from carriers in Europe, for example. Some of the biggest carriers want to offer business services around big data and um, almost 100%, actually not almost, 100% of the carriers that we have spoken to thus far want to partner with us and offer our platform um, as a cloud service. So cloud for us is a big initiative. Uh, it gives us um, the entire um, capability to reach audiences that we might not be able to reach ringing one doorbell at mm -hmm. a time. So it's, um, as I said, uh, we've got a very robust integrated cloud strategy. Our customers find that very, very interesting and uh, building that with a very robust partner channel, high priority for us. Second is using our platform as a development platform for application uh, on big data is again a priority and that's again right. building a partner ecosystem. Um, the third is uh, relationships with global SIs, Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, uh, the Indian SIs of Infosys and Wipro and HCL and the rest. Uh, we, we have some work to do, we've done some good work there, but um, there's uh, some work to be done there. Yeah. And, um, and not only that, I think some of the initiatives that we are launching in terms of uh, training as a service, uh, free certification, uh, are, are all things which are aimed at reaching out to the partners and uh, building, as I said, a robust partner you know, ecosystem. There's, there's a lot of talk at conferences like this about, especially in Hadoop, about complexity, complexity ecosystem, new projects, and 
and the difficulties, you know, uh, understanding that. But in, in reality, it seems as though today, anyway, the technology's pretty well understood. Uh, we talked about uh, millennials off camera coming out today with social savvy and tooling and right. understanding gaming and things right. like that. Right. Technology, getting it to work seems to not be the challenge anymore. It's, it's really understanding how to apply it, how to value data, we heard in your panel today. The business process, yes. which used to be very well known, it's counting, yes. you know, it's payroll, yes. simple. Yes. Now it's kind of ever-changing, you know, <laughs> daily. What do you make of that? How do you think that will affect the future of, of work? Yeah, I think <laughs> there, there's some very interesting questions that you've asked in that. The first, um, of course, is, you know, what does it take to have a very successful big data or Hadoop project? And I think we always talk about the fact that if you have a very robust business case backing a Hadoop project, that is the number one key ingredient to delivering a Hadoop project. Otherwise, you can tend to boil the ocean, all right, or try and eat an elephant in one bite, as I like mm -hmm. to say. <laughs> So, so that, that's one, and I think it's, you're right, it's not the technology, it's not the complexity, it's not the availability of the resources, it is a leadership issue in organizations where the leader demands certain outcomes, business outcomes from the Hadoop project team, and we've seen whenever that happens, the projects seem to be very, very successful. Now, the second part of the question about future of work, which is a very, very interesting topic and a topic which is very, very close to my heart, uh, there are going to be you know, more people than jobs in the next 20, 25 years. I think um, any job that can be automated will be automated or has been automated, right? So this is, this is going to have a society and impact on how we live. You know, I've been lucky enough that I joined this industry 25 years ago and I've never had to change or switch industries. But I can assure you that our kids, and we were talking about kids off camera as well, our kids will have to probably learn a new skill every five years. So how does that impact education? Right? We, we in our generation were testing champions. We were educated to score well in tests. But the new form of education, which you and I were talking yeah. about again in California where we live, and where my daughter goes to high school, and in her school, the number one, the number one priority is to instill a sense of learning and joy of learning in students because that is what is going to contribute to a robust future. You know, that's a good point. I want to just interject there because I think that the trends we're seeing in the higher ed side too also point to the impact of data science to curriculum and learning. It's not just putting catalogs online, um, it's, there's now kind of an iterative, kind of non-linear discovery to proficiency, but there's also the emotional quotient aspect. You mentioned the, the love of learning. Um, the immersion of tech and digital yes. is creating uh, interdisciplinary requirements. So all the folks say that, what, there's a statistics like half the jobs that are going to be available haven't even been just figured out yet, <laughs> meaning that the, there's a, a value creation around interdisciplinary skill sets an emotional quotient. Absolutely. Social emotional, because of the human social community <coughs> connectedness. This is also a big data challenge opportunity. No, 100%, <laughs> and I think uh, one of the things that, um, that we believe is in the future, jobs that require a greater amount of empathy are least susceptible to automation. So things like caring for old age, um, you know, people in the yeah. world, and nursing, and teaching, and artists, and all the rest, would be professions which would be um, highly paid and, and, and numerous. I also believe that you know the entire big data challenge about how you use data to impact communities yeah. is going to come into play. Um, and also, I think, John, you and, I get, you and I were again talking about it, the entire concept of corporations is only 200 years old, really, yeah. 200, 300 years old. Before that, our forefathers were individual contributors who contributed a certain part in a community, barbers, tailors, farmers, what have you. We are going to go back to the future where all of us will go back to being individual contributors. Yeah. And I think and again, I'm bringing it back to open source. Open source is the start of that community which will allow the community to go back to its roots of being individual contributors rather than being part of a organization or a corporation to be successful and to contribute. You know, the Coach's Penguin has been a, a very famous uh, seminal piece of work 
obviously um, uh, Ronald Coase, who wrote the book The Nature of the Firm, um, is interesting, but that's been a kind of a historical document. Um, if you look at blockchain, for instance, blockchain actually has the opportunity to disrupt what the nature of the firm is about exactly. because of smart contracts, supply chain, and whatnot. And we have this debate on theCUBE all the time. There's some naysayers. Um, I was just, Tim Connors of VC and I were talking on our Friday show, on Silicon Valley Friday show. He's actually a naysayer on blockchain. I'm pro blockchain because I think there's some skeptics that say blockchain is really hard to do because it requires an ecosystem. Yes. However, we're living in an ecosystem of world of community, so I think that the nature of the firm will be disrupted by people organizing in a new way vis-a-vis -vis blockchain. Because that's an open source paradigm. Yeah, no, I, I, I concur. So I'm, 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 a, I'm a believer in, in, in that entire concept, so I 100% I, I want to concur. come back to something you're talking about, about individual contributors and the relationship and link to open source and collaboration. I, I personally, I think we have to have a frank conversation of, about, I mean, machines have always replaced humans, but for the first time in, in our history, it's replacing cognitive functions. To your point about empathy, what are the things that humans can do that machines can't? And they become fewer and fewer every year. And a lot of these conferences, people don't like to talk about that, but it's a reality that we have it to talk about. And the, your point is right on. We're going back to individual contribution, open source collaboration. The other point is data. Is it going to be at the center of that innovation because it seems like value creation and maybe job creation in the future is going to be a result of the combinatorial effects of data, open source, collaboration, other innovation. It's not going to be because of Moore's law. <laughs> yeah, so, no, no, thoughts on that? 100%, and I think one of the aspects that we didn't touch upon is the new societal model that automation is going to create would need data-driven governance. Hmm. So a data-driven government is going to be a necessity because remember in those times, and I think in 25, 30 years, countries will have to explore the impact of negative taxation, right? Because of, of all the automation that actually happens uh, around citizen security, about citizen welfare, yeah? um, about cost of healthcare, cost of providing healthcare, all of that is going to be fueled by data, right? So it's just, um, it's, you know, as, as the Chinese proverb says, may you live in interesting yeah. times. We definitely are living in very interesting times. Well, and then the public policy implications are, you know, your friend and one of my business heroes, Scott McNeely, says there's no privacy in the internet, get over yes. it. We interviewed Don Tapscott last week, he said that's unacceptable. Yes. We yeah. have to solve that problem. Yeah. So yeah. it brings up a lot of public policy issues. Well, and the social and economic things. impact right now, there's a trend we're seeing where uh, the younger generation, we're talking about the post 9-11 generation uh, that is entering the workforce, they have a social conscience, right? So there's an emphasis you're seeing on social, um, and social good, AI for social good is one of the hottest trends out there, but the the changing landscape around data is interesting. So the word democratization has been used, um, whether you're looking at the early days of blogging and podcasting, which we were involved in in research, to now in media, this notion of data and transparency and open source is probably at a tipping point, all-time all high in terms of value, creation. So. I want to get your thoughts on this because as someone who's been in the proprietary world, the mode of operation was get something proprietary, lock it down, build a fence and a wall, protect it with folks with, with machine guns and, and, and fight for the competitive advantage. That's right. right? Yes. Now the competitive advantage is open. Okay, so you're looking at a pure open source model with Hortonworks, um, it changes how companies are competing. Because well, what is the competitive advantage of, of, of Hortonworks? Actually, to be more open. A hundred percent. And harness the community. How do you defend that? Yeah, no, no absolutely. I, I, I just think the, the proprietary nature of software, like software has disrupted a lot of businesses, all right? And it's not, um, it's not uh, resistant to disruption itself. I mean, there has never been a business model in the history of time where you, charge a lot of money to build a software that you, mm -hmm. or, or sell a software that you've built, and then whatever are the defects in that software, mm -hmm. you get paid more money to fix them. All right, it's the entire perpetual and maintenance model. That model yeah. is 
is going to get disrupted. Now, there are hundreds of billions of dollars involved in it, so people are going to come kicking and screaming to the open source world, yeah. but they will have to come to the open source world. Our advantage that we are seeing is innovation now in a closed loop environment, no matter what size of a company you are, cannot keep up with the changing you know, landscape around you yeah. from a data perspective. Yeah. So without the collective innovation of a community, I don't really think a technology can stay at par with the changes around it. This is what I say about, this is, I think it's such an important point that you're getting at because you know, um, we were started Silicon Angle actually in the Cloudera office, so we have a lot of friends that work there, we have a great admiration for them, but one of the things that Cloudera has done through their execution is they've been very profit oriented, go public at all costs kind of thing that they're doing now, you've seen that happen is the, compete, the competitive advantage that you're pointing out is something we're seeing that's similar with that Andy Jassy's doing at AWS, which is, it's not so much to build something proprietary per se, it's just to ship something faster. So if you look at Amazon's competitive advantage, is that they just continue to ship product faster and faster and faster than companies can build themselves. And also, the scale at what the, that they're getting with these economies is increasing the quality so oh, yeah, open source has also um, hit the naysayers on security. Right? Everyone says, oh, open source is not secure. As it turns out, it's more it's secure. More secure. <laughs> Amazon at scale is actually becoming more secure. Yes. So you're starting to see the new competitive advantage be ship more, be more open as the way to do business. Um, what do you think the impact will be to traditional companies, whether uh, it's a startup competing or um, an existing bank this is a paradigm shift. What's the impact going to be for a CIO or a CEO of a big company? How do they incorporate that competitive advantage? Yeah, I think um, you know the proprietary software world is not going to go away tomorrow, John. You know that. There's yeah. so much of installed software, and there's a saying from where I come from that even a dead elephant is worth a million dollars, right? So, so even that business model, even though it is it is sort of dying. Uh, it, it'll still be a good investment for the next 10 years because of the locked in you know, business model where customers cannot get out. Now, from a perspective of openness and what that brings as a competitive differentiators to our customer, just the very pace at which, you know, I, I, as I said, I've lived in a proprietary world, you would be lucky if you were getting the next version of our software every 18 months, you'd be lucky. In the open source community, you get a few versions in 18 months, you know? Yeah. So the cadence at which releases come out have just completely disrupted the proprietary model, right? It is just the collective, as I say, innovative, um, or innovation ability of a community has allowed us to release uh, to increase the release cadence to few months now, all right? And if our engineering team had its way, it'll further be cut short, <laughs> right? So the ability of customers, and what does that allow the customer to do? 10 years ago, if you looked for a capability from your proprietary vendor, they would say you have to wait 18 months, so what do you do? You build it yourself, yeah. all right? So that is what the spaghetti architecture was all about. In the new open source model, you ask the community, and if enough people in the community think that that's important, the community builds it for you and gives it to you. And the good news is the business model of open source is working, so um, you, got, you guys have been public, you got Cloudera going public, you have MuleSoft out there, a lot of companies out there now that are public companies are open source companies, so yes. a phenomenal changeover. But the other thing that's interesting is that the hiring factor for the large enterprise to the point of, your point about it's proprietary not updating, it's the same is true for the enterprise. So, just hiring candidates out of open source is now increases the talent pool oh, for a large enterprise. 100%, 100%. Well, I wonder if I could challenge this love fest for a minute. Um, <laughs> so, there's another saying, I didn't grow up there, but a dying snake can still bite you. So, yeah. I, I bring that up because there is this hybrid model that's emerging, because the, yeah. these, these elephants, you know, eventually they figure it out. Um, and so, uh, an example would be, we talked about Cloud Air and, and so forth, but a better example I think is IBM. What IBM has done to <coughs> embrace open source with investing years ago a billion dollars in the Linux, 
what it's doing with Spark to essentially try to elbow its way in and say, okay, yes. now we're going to co-opt that mm -hmm. ecosystem mm -hmm. and, and then build our proprietary pieces on top of it. That to me is a viable business model, is it not? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure it is. And, yeah. and to John's yeah. point that with um, the, the um, Mule going IPO and with Cloudera having successfully built a $250 million, $261 million business, it's, testimony, is one, yeah, it's, it's a testimony to the fact that yeah. companies can be built. Now, can they be more efficient? Sure, they can be more efficient. However, yeah. you know, my, my entire comment on this is, why are you doing open source? What is your intent of doing open source? To be seen as open or to be truly open? Because in our philosophy, if you add a slim layer of proprietariness, why are you doing that? And as a businessman, I'll tell you why. You increase the stickiness factor by locking okay, in your absolutely. customer, yeah, right? Yeah. So let's not, again, we're we are having a frank conversation. Yeah. Proprietary code equals customer lock-in, period. We agree. Right? And, and as, um, a business not, sure model, as a business model, I it do. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, we'll I'll take it. Yeah. 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 So it's a customer lock-in. Now, as a business model, it is, you know, the if you if you were to go with the um, with the business models of the past, yes, um, I believe most of the analysts yeah. will say it's a stickier, better business model. But then, you know, we will like to prove them wrong, and yeah. that's that's our mission as open source. Well, I mean, just, I would so I say that Amazon's the mother of all lock-ins. So you you kind of bristled at that before. Yeah, but, but they're not. I mean, they're not. I mean, open. They use a lot of open source. I mean, do they open source it? But getting back to the lock-in. Lock-in is a function of stickiness, right? So stickiness can be open source. Like you could argue that Horton works through their relationship with partnering has a lock-in spec with, with their stickiness of being open, right? So I come back down to the proprietary My thing. search engine, I like well, Google. So well, I mean, Google certainly got a ton of- got me locked in because I like it? Well, there was a lot of, do you care? It's proprietary technology that Google's built. But we, that, switching costs, as we talked about before. No, well, that, the but you're not between, paying for search. True. Well, the value, <laughs> if the value exceeds the price of the lock-in, then it's an opportunity. So Paul Marich is talking about the hardened Absolutely. top. The hardened top. Do you care what's in an Intel processor? Well, Intel is a proprietary platform that provides processing <coughs> power, so, but it enables a lot of other values. So I think the stickiness factor of, say, IBM is interesting, and they've done a lot of open source to defend them on Linux, for example, they're doing a ton of blockchain. But they're priming the pump for their own business. That's clear exactly. for their lock-in. Raj their... wasn't saying there's not value there. He's saying it's lock-in, and yeah. it is. Well, some customers will, will pay for convenience. Yes, They'll say, hey, your point, point is there's, there's, if, if the value exceeds the lock-in risk, then it's worth yes, it. Yes, that's my point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 100%, yeah. 100%. And that's I mean, where the opportunity is. So you can use open source to get to a value trajectory. That's the, that's the barriers to entry. We've seen it on the entrepreneurship side, right? It's easier to start a company now than ever before. Why? Because it'll open source and cloud, right? Correct. So does that mean that every startup's going to be super successful and beat IBM? No, not really. Do you think there'll be a red hat of big data and will you be it? We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> if I had my way, yeah, that's, definitely. That's really, the, that, that, that's, you know, that's, that's really why the I'm here. That's the best example, right? Yes, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, the one thing that, that excites us about our business here is, you know, as, as my former boss used to say, you could be as good as you think you are, or the best in the world, but if you're in the landline business right now, you're, you're not going to have a, a very bright future. Uh, however, the business that we are in, the pull from the market that we get, and you're seeing here, right, and, and, and these are you know, days that we have very often where customer pull is remarkable. I mean, this industry is growing at you know, depending on which analyst you're talking to, somewhere between 50 to 80 percent year on year. All right, every customer um, uh, is is a prospect for us. There isn't a single conversation that we have with any organization, almost of any size, where they don't think that they can use their data better or they can enhance and improve their data strategy. So, if if that is that is in place, and I'm confident about our execution. I'm very, very uh, happy with the technology platform, with the support that we get from our customers. So, you know, 
all, all things seem to be lining up. <laughs> Raj, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. No, no, Appreciate no, no, your time. We had a little bit over, I think a lot of time, but I wanted to get uh, your insights as the new president and chief operating officer of Hortonworks. Congratulations on the new role and looking forward to seeing the results. Since you're a public company, we'll be actually be able to see the scoreboard. Yes. Congratulations and thanks for coming on theCUBE. There's more coverage here live for DataWorks 2017. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vaughn. Stay with us, more great interviews, day two coverage. We'll be right back.